Good morning, everybody. This is Haya Griva Rao from Stanford University. Uh, we're all delighted you've uh, joined us this morning for a conversation with John Lilly. As uh, Roni mentioned, uh, John's uh, not only an accomplished uh, engineer, uh, but he's also a very accomplished builder of organizations. He's founded his own organization, Reactivity. He's been the CEO there. Uh, and also replaced himself there with a successor, then went on to Mozilla, and currently is at um, Greylock. I can also assure you that in my experience, he certainly has been one of the most well-read, if not the most well-read CEOs. He reads close to 100 books a year, and we were just talking about some of the interesting books uh, that he was um, reading. Uh, uh, let's actually get him involved straight away in the conversation. John, th thank you very much. Uh, could you begin by telling us a little bit about what are the key milestones in your career and what insights did you glean, if you will, from those milestones? Yeah, sure. Well, th thanks for having me. And I, you know, I used to read 100 books a year. Now that I have kids, I read you know, more like three and <laughs> a bunch of pages from each book, so not as many. But um, yeah, so, um, as you know, like I, was, I was an engineer here at Stanford, so an undergrad, and what I really wanted to do was build computers. So a little bit like the, like the president, John Hennessy, I wanted to do faster and faster chips. And probably the biggest turning point in my, in my career to that point had been a bunch of people helped me understand that it didn't really matter how fast computers uh, would go if nobody wanted to use them. And that that led me to to be one of the first one of the early students here in something called human computer interaction, which um, led to much of the work at the, at the design school. But it's really about how do you make computers that are that are in software that are run in service of humans. And that was a that was a big change for me. So what it was you know as I grew up a very technical person like building things in service of humans was key. Now after Stanford I worked at a startup. Uh, a company called Trilogy, and we'll talk about that, where I learned to recruit. I, I worked at Apple for a little while when Steve came back, which is an interesting, Steve Jobs came back. And then uh, I ran my own startup for a little while. My own startup, we did one thing, and then we pivoted to another thing, which was a hard, and maybe we'll talk about that a little bit, a hard a hard experience, but um, meaningful for me. And then probably the, 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 the biggest accomplishment in my career is really running Mozilla. So I was at Mozilla for a number of years when we released Firefox and 2004, about six months before I got there, and then I, I joined and we, we grew it from about 5 million users to about 450 million users around the world. So it was a, it's quite a, quite a fun thing, and I've been, a, I've been on the, the investing side for the last two years, and I've been lucky to work with some of the most interesting companies in the world, Instagram and Dropbox and Tumblr and mm -hmm. others. I, if I might just follow, uh, follow that up with a quick uh, uh, question. Uh, you know, in this very accomplished uh, career, um, let's begin with Trilogy and Apple. What lessons have you learned uh, about innovation from your early and formative experiences there? Yeah, well, so, so Trilogy you probably use a little explaining because a lot of people haven't heard of it. When I, when I got to Trilogy, it was about 80 people, and it was a, one of the hottest startups at a time when startups weren't such a big deal. Um, Trilogy in, in, in 1995 was, you know, it, it, they weren't, there were startups like Netscape and Quicken, but was, it wasn't a common practice to go to go to a startup. And when I got there, it would be, this is similar to Apple, and I will describe Apple, but Trilogy had gotten stuck. So they had built themselves on one product that was around sales configuration. And they had built this culture up of 50, 60 people, all oriented towards that. And the product had been so successful that they had built all their processes and culture around it. And they didn't quite know how to move, how to evolve onto the next product. And so, you know, Joe Lamont, a Stanford grad, what he decided to do was hire a bunch of, um, or Stanford dropout, I think he was, but um, he decided to hire a bunch of people all at once to work on a completely different product line. And so he had big, so, you know, there were probably 80 people in the company at the time. Joe hired 50 of us all 23, 24 years old, and said, okay, we're going to go do something completely different than the company has done to date, go work on this new product. And he kind of let the new 50 people kind of run head-to-head -head at, the, at the existing team. So he was trying to break the culture, break the break getting stuck with this massive, big change. Um, and I think to, to a large extent it worked, and it really changed the culture of the place and changed a lot of um, assumptions about what, what worked and what didn't. Apple was interesting. You know, I, I was at Apple um, when I was a student here in 1994, 1995, and then I came back to be at Apple in 1997. And I think Apple in 1997 was bad times. Um, I think that it's hard to remember this now. You know, Apple 
was around like a two or three billion dollar market cap company. It was trading at about the cash we had on hand. Everybody assumed that we were going to get bought by Sun. Um, and so it was a really miserable time. And the Apple products hadn't innovated very in a long, long time. And so while I was there in 1997 is when they decided to buy Next, which you know we didn't really appreciate it at the time. It was a good. It was a sort of a uh, a nice story to get Steve Jobs back in the company and have a local homecoming and all that stuff. I think nobody really appreciated that buying Next would lead an, an inside-out revolution, not so different than what we did in Trilogy, but this outside force coming in and suddenly taking over all the DNA of the place. And so, you know, I was there at a time when things were, Apple had become, I think, a big and dumb and slow company in all, virtually every way. It was still fun because you were still kind of living on the, um, on the, some of the innovation and some of the reputation and some of the sort of swagger Apple had built up through the 80s and 90s, but it wasn't it wasn't an innovative company in any way. And so, you know, I was there while Steve came back, and you know, he he uh, he changed the culture almost immediately by storytelling and narrative and giving people a mission and by saying no to a lot of things. And so, I think both Trilogy and Apple. What I learned is that when you're when things are going in a bad direction, what you really want to do is make large changes to to fix things. Hmm. Which raises an interesting question. If, when things are going really bad, uh, you know, large changes matter, uh, what about when things are going really well? Yeah, yeah, so it's interesting. So I think you, and I guess I should say the trilogy, the things weren't going bad, we just knew we were going to get stuck. Mm. And Apple things were legitimately going bad. Mm. <laughs> Apple wasn't a, wasn't a very fun place other than it was, a, it was, you know, the cafeteria was pretty good in 1997. Um, but, um, and so, you know, when things are going well, I think you really start to look for compounding benefits. So you start to look for, you know, as you start to scale, you're scaling organizationally, or you're scaling users, or you're scaling influence, then small wins, so small changes day to day, uh, they start to compound day to day, week to week, month to month. You know, when Instagram was starting to grow, mm -hmm. like a very, very small change in their product mm -hmm. would lead to you know, more users um, joining, you know, every week. And so, the, and then the effects compound because the network effects get built in. I think especially in today's world where everything is so connected, so networked, so network-oriented, um, thinking in terms of compound interest is key. So I think, you know, when things are not going well, big changes matter. When things are going well, I think small changes matter. Mm -hmm. and, but it's a funny thing because in a lot of ways, I think small changes are trickier for people to notice. As, mm. as, as a leader, as a CEO, I've come to think that the main job, that the number one job of the, of the CEO is to be the storyteller in chief mm. and, and to talk about the narrative and help people understand the reasons why the company is doing what it's doing. What you're trying to do is help people make decisions on their own. Mm -hmm. And people don't, when you're the CEO, you tell the story so often mm -hmm. that you can say, "Oh, well, this is my this is my version A, and mm -hmm. this is my slightly different nuanced mm -hmm. version B." Mm -hmm. But most people won't hear the nuance, and mm -hmm. so as CEO, it's easier to make big changes, mm -hmm. like you know, like Marissa's doing at Yahoo mm -hmm. now, or Meg is doing at HP, than just make small changes a lot of and then be heard. Mm -hmm. uh, because the small changes don't get noticed, right? And you know, our theme, of course, is uh, how do we prevent a company from being big and dumb? And um, you, you know, hinted that uh, you, you mentioned uh, what happened at uh, Trilogy and certainly at Apple. Um, why do companies uh, become dumb when they become big? Yeah, you know, my sense um, uh, is that if companies get bigger, uh, or any organization gets bigger, I think what happens is that the number of connections inside the company, the number of activities inside the company start to potentially overwhelm the direct customer thing. So it mm. becomes more, there's, you can start to fill up your calendar with internal, when you're a small company, when you're five or ten people, mm -hmm. you, you almost can't do anything except for have more customer touches than mm -hmm. internal touches because there's mm -hmm. only so much you can do with other people in the room. Mm -hmm. And so I think by nature you're focused outward. So there's way, way more people outside. Mm -hmm. And then as you get, you start to get groups that are bigger, groups that are five or 10 or 20 people and organizations mm -hmm. that are five, you know, 50 or 100 or 1,000 people, suddenly you can start to, you, can, you start to build processes to make mm -hmm. sure that you have alignment inside and you start to see, you start to see how internal actions start mm -hmm. to overtake external actions. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot, a, a good sign that um, 
that you're becoming a little bit dumb mm-hmm. is when people have more internal meetings than they do thinking about their customers. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of times we would talk at in Mozilla, where mm-hmm. you know, we were when we made Firefox, we would talk about, you know, this is a great meeting to have. It's good to good to get aligned and good to talk about talk through our differences. But you know, is any of this really helping us make a good browser for actual human beings, for your mm-hmm. dad or your cousin or your mom or whoever? Mm-hmm. And I think that having clarifying questions like that and really understand why, understanding why you're in business. It's not to have your internal, you know, uh, configuration alignment, symmetry, synergy meeting. Mm-hmm. It's to get to build good products for customers. And so mm-hmm. being able to, to, to tell your story in a way that lets you um, cycle back to that all the time mm-hmm. is key. So is the calendar of a chief executive sort of like a, a blood pressure monitor, if you will, uh, of individuals? You can look at somebody's calendar and quickly say, hey, this is on the pathway to becoming dumb and this isn't? I mean... Yeah, well, I don't think it's the CEO, because I think that um, as a CEO, I, I, I always felt like my job was to, to try to help other people be external. And mm. so obviously, there, I think it, different leaders are different. And some, and some are going to be externally focused by nature. Some are going to be internally focused and manager oriented. My, I always felt like my job was to help people understand the, mm. the, the trade-offs they're making inside and outside. Mm-hmm. And so um, my calendar was always a pretty good mix of external and internal things. Mm-hmm. I think that what you I think that as you as you go and you observe companies, though, it's pretty easy to tell mm-hmm. whether they are spending more time just sort of navel gazing and mm-hmm. thinking about things together or externally. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I think it just kind of depends on the on the organization. Mm-hmm. But rhythms are important. That's right. Rhythms are important. So. Uh, as we sort of transition to the uh, next question, uh, can you tell us a little bit about the other things that you did at uh, Mozilla yeah. uh, to prevent organizations from big, uh, becoming big and dumb? And here, perhaps, uh, would a distinction be valid between dumb as stupid and dumb as sort of uh, silent and mute? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, I, I probably wouldn't call them dumb. I think that organizations, as they get um, older, they become less effective mm-hmm. and more susceptible to um, being beat by smaller, like more focused companies. And obviously, that's my point of view from a venture capital investing point of view. That's my point of view from Silicon Valley. Um, you know, my sense is that you really want to understand why you're growing and why you're scaling. Mm-hmm. And I think organizational scaling. I think some people view it as a is the thing is the reason you're you're in business. Mm-hmm. I've never thought that. I think that impact in the world and or understanding understanding what you're trying to scale is the key. For Mozilla, um, you know, we had a number of things we were trying to scale, and um, it, what, for us, it wasn't the traditional thing. We weren't trying to scale revenue. We were trying to scale influence and, and, at a global scale, and so we were trying to, to make the browser world better. And at the time, it was pretty bad. And we knew we had a number of components to that. We had developers. Uh, we were an open source project, we had community members, we had users, we had web developers, and understanding which things needed to scale in which ways um, was pretty key. Um, you know, for, and so for us, one of the things we always thought about was a, a leverage ratio. So um, sort of for each employee of the company, how many community members were we enabling to do work Mm-hmm. In, the, in the broader context, how many users were we enabling? And I think <clears throat> I think these leverage metrics are pretty key to understanding what's happening as you as you switch, because as you're getting big, especially on the internet, you get to these systems that have 10 or 50 or 100 or a billion users now. It's they'll always carry themselves in momentum, and so user user action is almost always a lagging indicator of whether you're scaling or whether you make whether you're scaling well or making mistakes. And so what you're trying to do is find metrics that sort of your canary in the coal mine mm-hmm. so to, to give you hints that, that you need to change well before you see it in user metrics. Mm-hmm. And um, for us, it was all about leverage in the community because that was sort of the, that was a projection for us of, mm-hmm. of people who were inside the company to, to people who felt um, connected with the organization. So, you know, for us, the, the tools we had, um, there are a bunch of things. We'll talk about sort of rhythms and pacings in a second. Um, uh, for me, the more that I've been involved with startups, the more I start to think about the importance of vocabulary mm. and alignment. And, you know, we already talked about storytelling. The reason I think storytelling is important is because every organization, every entrepreneurial organization that wants to change the world, the best ones 
understand what the world looks like when they win. Mm-hmm. And and the best ones remember that they can see the future, but nobody else can see their future yet. Mm-hmm. And so what you want to do is continually tell the story about what the future looks like and why it matters, and then tell enough of the story to employees or customers or partners or you know other people to help them believe and and, and sort of support the mission from here to there. And <clears throat> one of the things that one of the things that the CEO you mentioned I replaced myself as my as my C, uh, as CEO of my startup. One of the things that he I he talked to me a lot about was vocabulary and the alignment of vocabulary mm. because you know he he'd been like a 22 year guy at HP and I and I had been a startup guy a startup punk all my life I guess and um and so he comes in and you talk about things and the first year was a funny a funny year because he had a bunch of ideas and I my, they were not exactly the same as my ideas and so I'm pretty sure he tried to fire me four or five times or he would have liked to fire me but the um and then what we realized at the end of that year is that. On a lot of things, we were talking about the same thing, but using different words, mm-hmm. and or using different using the same words talking about different things. And one example is we were talking. We had this meeting. I remember we were talking about well, in the short term, this is important. He mm-hmm. said he asserted something. I'm like, are you got to be kidding me? In the short term, that's not important at all. This other thing is important. Mm-hmm. But we realized that when he meant short term, he meant the 18 month roadmap, and when I meant said short term, I meant like Tuesday. Mm-hmm. And so like, and so once you figured out that vocabulary was different, and you mm-hmm. could start to align a vocabulary. And you, you could you could start to ask questions to understand what each person was doing, and you could start to build a line and back up. Mm-hmm. And I started to think I've come to believe that storytelling and vocabulary is key for building alignment, and that alignment is key in an organization. Because what you're trying to do is every organization that's doing interesting stuff is moving faster than it's comfortable. They're all you're trying to grow a little bit more more more, more quickly than it's comfortable. You're trying to be in market a little bit more quickly. You're trying to release product more quickly. And so what you're trying to do is get as many people able to make as many decisions as they can in mm-hmm. ways that are consistent and additive. Mm-hmm. They're not always what you would make. Sometimes mm-hmm. they're surprising and good, mm-hmm. but you're trying to kind of reduce the times that the decisions are surprising and bad. But mm-hmm. in order for people to do that, they kind of have to understand the story, they have to understand the mission, they have to understand kind of where you're trying to, this, this vision of the future. That's mm-hmm. key. You know, one of the talks I gave, uh, or I gave at Mozilla was called Poetry and Pragmatics. Mm-hmm. And, and um, I talked about the, um, the poetry of organization. It's the it's the lyrical it's the it's the it's the it's the aspirational story. Mm-hmm. And Mozilla, the story was we want the technology to be open. We want people to be able to build technology, not wait for mm-hmm. Larry Page to drop it or Steve Jobs to drop it or, or, or Bill Gates. We wanted people to be partic- participate and hack. Hacking was the poetry. The pragmatics were a little bit different. So the pragmatics were, well, we do believe in that, but there are some keys to how we actually run and how we make decisions. Mm -hmm. And so understanding the difference between poetry and pragmatics in an organization, and then understanding that the pragmatics can go out of alignment a little bit for Mm -hmm. a little bit of time, but if you get pragmatics out of alignment for a long time, Mm -hmm. then you then you you hit real problems. So Mm -hmm. I really come to to think about the chief's job again: storytelling, alignment, trying to help people understand the prioritization stack to make decisions on their own. Mm-hmm. So here's an interesting question. Uh, when uh, companies become big and are stuck, what do you lead with? Do you lead with poetry first or do you lead with pragmatics first? Oh, yeah, I think um, I think there's, well, like I said, I think you have to, in when in when things are going well and you're 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 compounding the wins as you go along, you can make small wins and, and do very well. But I said look, when, you, when you have to make a big change, <coughs> I think a lot of times you have to do you have to lead with poetry. I think mm-hmm. you have to remind people why they're there. Mm-hmm. Because a lot of times, you know, Chip Heath, mm-hmm. you know, from from Stanford mm-hmm. here wrote a book called Stories That Stick, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And and every organization that got that has gotten to an interesting point <coughs> has along the way Told stories that are sticky. Mm-hmm. They they catch and they catch the, the imagination of employees or they catch the imagination of customers or what have you. And that when things are going bad, the problem is those stories they might not be relevant anymore, but they're still sticky. Mm-hmm. And so you have to change the story. Mm-hmm. And you know maybe the, the most illustrative one um, um, uh, that I can tell is when Steve came back to Apple. Mm-hmm. And you know I've told this a little bit on my blog, but you know. It, it was a bad time for Apple, and Michael Dell at the time was, had been asked on his shareholder call, "What should Apple do with with Next?" And he said, "Well, I think they should close shop and give all the money back to their shareholders. That's the responsible thing to do," is what Dell said, which is interesting given what he's going through now. <laughs> um, and so, in the 
Steve came back and he led a town hall where he, started, talked, about, where he talked about what, what we were going to do. He said, look, we're going to build some great products and um, we're, going to build, we're going to change the world. And if you're, if you're fired up about that, let's, get on, let's move on with it. If you're not, then get the hell out. And then somebody asked him about what Michael Dell said. And Steve's answer was, well, fuck Michael Dell. That's exactly what he said. And I'll say, I, I swear to you, like, everybody in that room would have followed Steve off a cliff mm-hmm. that day. Mm-hmm. Because he had just changed the area so well from being kind of this big, sclerotic company that hadn't been doing much to, well, we're going to go change the world, and nobody's going to believe it, mm-hmm. and that's fine. Mm-hmm. But all that's important is whether we do. Mm-hmm. And if you believe it, let's go, and if you don't, we don't need you. Mm-hmm. And so he changed it to an usher-them narrative very, mm-hmm. very quickly. Mm-hmm. And I think it's probably, it probably the most powerful sort of single leadership instance of, of my career. Uh-huh. New career. Uh, let's actually move to the next important question. Since you uh, have designed top management teams and as uh, you know, venture capitalists, you evaluate them, how do you build and manage a top team that's primed to scale well? Yeah, well, I like the Stanford football team. Good <laughs> short slide. Um, but uh, um, I think it's, it's how, do you, how do you help people make decisions, like uh-huh. I said. So it's, it's how do you help people try to get a little ahead of the obvious metrics mm-hmm. that, that I said are lagging indicators of user growth and customer growth, and how do you get them as early as possible to see what you'll need to change over time. I think there's, um, yeah, I think that's what I would say. Mm-hmm. Let's come to the question of rhythms. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, maybe what we'll do is, uh, we've been talking about scaling and rhythms. Uh, so could you share a couple of ideas about what is rhythm, and why is that important to uh, sustain successful scaling? Yeah, I think rhythm is a great word. I was excited um, to see, see you wanted to talk about it. Um, you know, for us, I think there's a few different things. Um, number one is you're trying to teach you're trying to teach organizations how to think about the changes they want to see in the world, mm-hmm. and think about how to measure themselves, mm-hmm. and think about how to pr- make promises to each other. Mm-hmm. So. As organizations scale, you get different groups working on different process, parts of the parts of the puzzle, mm-hmm. and you need to be able to communicate and commit mm-hmm. to each other. Mm-hmm. And so, building in daily, weekly, quarterly, monthly, yearly sort of rhythms and being able to say, "Here's what we're going to do. Uh, here's where I need help. Here's where I'm, I'm not sure what's happening." Mm-hmm. Uh, and then being able to kind of follow up on that and say, "Well, here's what we did. Here's what we didn't do." Mm-hmm. And you're trying to build in rhythms of accountability. I think is what I would say. Mm-hmm. Rhythms of promise and rhythms of accountability. So you're trying to say, here's what we're going to do. Here's how we did. Mm-hmm. Here's what I think we're going to do next week, next 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 time. Mm-hmm. And, and and have people start to raise their hand in a way to say that doesn't make sense to me or I need help mm-hmm. or, or what have you. So mm-hmm. I think rhythms are huge. I think there are some that are calendar rhythms, mm-hmm. and just like just like papers in school, they're at some level they're designed to force action. Mm-hmm. So. Um, designed to um, make sure that at least every quarter people pull all-nighters to get mm-hmm. everything done. At some level, you're trying to generate activity. Mm-hmm. At some level, you're trying to just keep people honest and um, uh, thoughtful and reflective about what happened in a, in a given time period. Mm-hmm. And then there's other sort of milestone-based things that are more technology and process things that may not be calendar-based rhythms, but being uh, paying attention to celebrating when things happen, whether they're on a schedule or not, mm-hmm. that, I think that kind of rhythm is, is builds good, um, good practice as well. Mm-hmm. So in this calendar rhythm, you mentioned daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly. Um, what's, which one of those is a good leverage point? Oh, uh, yeah, so I think they're all, I think they're all pretty important. So, um, you know, I think that um, what I found uh, as a manager is that People are pretty good about setting daily things. Mm-hmm. Like the, you, you come into the morning, and it's not hard to teach people to say, "Well, here's the things you have to do today. Let's make sure you get them done." That, but as you, as you start to dilate that time period, it gets harder to be honest with yourself. Mm-hmm. And so, even a week, even at a weekly level, mm-hmm. like when I have bad weeks, it's a little bit hard to remember what I did. And mm-hmm. so you, you start to look back and say, "Oh, well, let, let's see what I did." And so, you're trying to figure, you're trying to get people used to looking back at the week and mm-hmm. saying, well, here's what I did, here's where I fell down, here's where I was wrong in my assumptions. And you're trying to get people to turn a critical eye to their own time. Mm-hmm. And even at a weekly scale, I think that if you don't build a discipline or practice around that, you, mm-hmm. get, uh, you get a little bit lazy. Mm-hmm. And so so building up that accountability for yourself, and sometimes what, what you 
what I did a lot is I just said, well, within each group, let's send around weekly updates, and, mm -hmm. and you'll start to get weekly. And it's just artic having to articulate it for other people helps you understand what's happening. Mm -hmm. um, but then <clears throat> when you send it to monthly or quarterly, it becomes even harder to think about. Mm -hmm. And so what you're trying to do is develop tools so that people start to feel like what it, it start to get a really acute sense of what it feels like when you're at the end of the period, mm -hmm. and you didn't get as much accomplished as you wanted to. Mm -hmm. And you and you have to sort of model that by feeling what it feels like that on the day mm -hmm. or the week or the month or the quarter. And mm -hmm. so and then as you as you develop more and more people able to think longitudinally like that, mm -hmm. you start to be able to set more um, more organizational goals mm -hmm. that you actually hit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's the longitudinal version of alignment as yeah, well. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, what are the symptoms that uh, a company is scaling too fast or too far? Is there such a thing as overscaling? And oh, sure. How do we know that? Yeah. Well, so I think it's really, really hard to do, to see why you're doing it. Because I think that most scaling, most most things that are going really well feel really. Uh, it feels like the wheels are going to come off the place while you're scaling it. Mm. And so, <clears throat> I think almost everything that's that's you're taking, you're making the most of the opportunity feels really janky and really scary as you're mm -hmm. scaling it. And so I think that, um, you know, my sense is that it's hard to tell whether you're scaling too fast. And so you try to come up with these metrics like we were talking about, these leverage metrics mm -hmm. or whatever. But these are all, these are all reflections. So they're mm -hmm. not, they're not primary data. They're, you're trying to see out of the corner of your eye whether the things you're kind of holding together or not. So mm -hmm. for us in Mozilla, it was about, um, you know, is the, are we in, enabling as many community members as we used to? Mm -hmm. um, and so understanding ratios and things like that is a way to get to get early. And then being honest with yourself about whether those really were were the right metrics in practice, because you, mm -hmm. you tend to you tend to to, um, to teach to the test, right? Yeah, that's right. Uh, that's exactly uh, the case. Okay. Uh, perhaps uh, this is a good um, juncture for you to very close, very quickly close on a couple of warning signs, if you will. I mean, you know, when do you know that the red light's on? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, this is the one that we were talking about at the very beginning, which is if you find people are more interested in internal meetings than they are in customers, or you, you have more people talking about, you know, um, Group to group uh, mm -hmm. communication or group to group warfare, and then you have people talking about who's actually using your product. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a pretty that's a pretty good indicator. Mm -hmm. so uh, it may be the best indicator. Mm -hmm. So that's a very telling um, sign, as it were. Um, at this stage, let's actually invite a bunch of questions. I imagine uh, you know there are lots of questions uh, that people have, and we want to make sure uh, that uh, all of you have, uh, uh, get as much of a chance to have some of your questions heard and. Um, uh, for John to uh, respond to that. And before we do that, uh, if there's a short uh, closing sort of piece of advice you'd give to entrepreneurs, what might that be? I mean, in a sentence or two, you know? Oh, you know, I always did well by just doing things that are interesting to me and doing mm -hmm. things that I like and not trying to not trying to spreadsheet it or try to figure out what I should be doing. Mm -hmm. So going off and finding the people and the stuff that I like, and mm -hmm. I think that's a, that's the best entrepreneur to that, in my experience. So here's uh, uh, an interesting uh, uh, question. Uh, I'm a 20-year-old entrepreneur who's working on a startup, but I find it hard to find investors and the right team members to execute an idea. Where do you suggest I begin? <laughs> um, that's sort of the million-dollar question. I think that uh, it all depends on where you are and what you believe in and what, what type of company you're working on. I think that um, what I would encourage you to do is to be active, to be active online, to tumble and tweet and blog and um, talk about what you're, what you're doing with as many people as possible. And then to the extent you can, um, build, a, build a mentor network. So, you know, I've been very lucky uh, or... I was lucky to get this, this advice when I was probably 22, which is just go find as many mentors as you can and start to build that network up. And over time what happens is you start to ask people for help. A lot of times people will say yes. So a lot of times people you've never met, when you ask them for help, they'll just say, yep, I have time. Uh, give you a new coffee at 5.30 or coffee at 10 at night or coffee on Tuesday morning or whatever it is. And a lot of people will say yes. And then you start you start asking questions and you start to be aggressive about asking for as many people 
um, to engage as you can, and then over time you start to build up your network, and your network becomes a live thing. And um, you know, I think it's a it, it's it's not a linear process. So you can't it, I can't give you an answer on how to go from here to you know being Drew House and running Dropbox you know directly. But um, what I can say is that um, you know, you start to pull on strings, and you'll pull on strings, and you'll find some unexpected things. And as you, if you go in with an attitude of learning and engaging and trying to be as helpful as you can for other people, mm -hmm. I think over time you'll start to build a network that'll that'll um, that'll give you the people you need. That'll give you the people you need. A couple of uh, another interesting uh, uh, question is: uh, uh, How do you address employees who consistently fail to meet? the metrics in terms of productivity and leverage, uh, if you will, uh, you know. Uh, yeah. Well, I think there's a lot, there's a few different schools. I think a lot of people say, well, look, if they don't, if they're, if they're consistently failing, you've got to, you've got to move them out. And I think that's often true. Um, you know, my experience, I think when you hire somebody, when companies make a commitment to employees, just like employees make a commitment to companies, I think there's, there's some there's some threshold that if if people are trying hard, I think it's incumbent upon you as a as a leader and you as a manager to try to figure out to try to to try to debug that relationship a little bit if it's not working. Mm -hmm. If it's not working consistently, then I think nobody likes to like to not be good at what they're doing. I think that you know, and a lot of times when I've when I've let people go, mm -hmm. um, they've been as relieved as I have to to make that break and move on. Although mm -hmm. it's not never been easy, but sometimes. It's just been people in the wrong seat where mm -hmm. we didn't really understand what they were trying to do and they didn't really understand the organization. And so going in with a, an attitude of debugging the problem mm -hmm. and um, the employee coming with a growth mindset and mm -hmm. the employer coming and saying, look, people can change, people can grow, then I think it's worth that kind of discussion once or twice. Mm -hmm. um, and trying to help, sometimes it's the people... Uh, are uncomfortable being measured or uncomfortable with metrics, and mm -hmm. sometimes you just have to help them understand that it's not it's not a terrible thing to be measured. And once mm -hmm. you measure it, you can make things better. Mm -hmm. So here's a, a very interesting question about uh, poetry and rhythm. Uh, the question is: You talked about poetry and the rhythm of business. What fostered your interest in humanities in relation to business culture? Uh, and uh, you know, if I could just add a follow-on. When you began as a, a you know, top-flight computer science engineer here at Stanford, would you even emphasize that you'd be talking about the importance of poetry? <laughs> well, uh, so I was not a top-flight computer scientist, and I am not now. Um, I was a, a mediocre computer scientist, but I tried hard. Um, so um, I don't know. It's a good question. Like, I, in, in truth, I don't like poetry as per se. So what I, what I really what – what you try to find um, – I've always felt like the split between how you um, – when I was at Stanford, I took a number of classes around sociology and cognitive science, and but I also, I also really like classics, and I really like language, so I took German and Latin. And, um, and for me, um, how we communicate is sort of key. So how we communicate – is not necessarily a humanities thing, and how we and how we make money is not necessarily a business thing. Mm -hmm. What we're trying to do, and I think I think this stuff's all coming back, is is coming is getting better integrated now with guys like Dan Ariely mm -hmm. and Daniel Pink, as mm -hmm. we sort of behavioral econ economists, where we start to say, look, like, let's let's understand a little bit better about why people do what they do and how they're motivated. And um, I, all I would say is that mostly people aren't motivated by numbers on a spreadsheet. Um, you know, like, uh, I remember when I was. At uh, Mozilla, which is a nonprofit, which most people don't know, uh, uh, business schools would come in and we'd talk about what we do. And, you know, invariably, you know, some second year would raise their hand and say, well, how do you get people to work here for a nonprofit? Like, why don't, why don't they want to go make a gajillion dollars at, at Google or Facebook? And, and the funny thing is, like, you, you say, well, how many decisions have you made yourself in the past week or month or year? And then you say, and they've all made hundreds or thousands, right? And you say, well, how many of those was economic gain the most important criteria? Mm. And almost never, almost always it's none of them. Mm. Like people don't, I mean, people, you need to make money and you want to, and, and often, but um, 
there's lots and lots of reasons you make you make decisions for self worth or impact in the world or because it's interesting to you or just because you think it might be fun. And understanding why people make decisions and not treating it like it's purely an economic decision, I think ironically is oftentimes the way to the best economic outcome. Mm. So Anyway, so I think that going after money directly is almost never the right way to build a great product. Mm. But building a great product almost always is the way to um, to kind of work your way towards the best economic outcome. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I've never thought about humanities versus business split. I've always thought it's all about how humans work. Mm -hmm. That's a wonderful note to uh, end the question period. And uh, I'm going to turn it over now to Andrea again. Thank you, John. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Rao and John Williams, for sharing this morning with us. Uh, you provided some great insights. And uh, again, thank you for your, for your time.